Good morning. I'd like you to turn, please, in your Bibles once again to the book of Acts of the Apostles in chapter 14, Acts chapter 14. And we're going to read from verse 21 down to verse 28, just a short passage. And at first reading, you might wonder, well, what is there to say about this passage? I hope that we'll see that short as it is, uh, it is a very important little section. So beginning with verse 21, it says, when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia and then sailed to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode long time with the disciples. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us. We're just kind of concluding the first missionary journey, Acts 13 and 14, really detail for us the first missionary journey. And one of the things that stands out about this journey is that there was a lot of opposition to the gospel. In fact, we, as we've gone through this together, we've noticed that uh, there are certain things that happened in chapter 13, verse 50. It says, the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. So one place they're expelled, chapter 14, verse 5. It says, and when there was an assault made, both of the Gentiles and also the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and stone them. And so, again, in another place, there's a there's a plot hatched to abuse them and stone them. And, of course, they, they move on. And then, of course, chapter 14, verse 19, it says, There came there the certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and, having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. So I suppose you can look at this first missionary journey and say, wow, what a lot of hassle. <laughs> I mean, expel from cities, attempts, plots to stone them, and then finally succeeding in stoning Paul and leaving him for dead. That was their first missionary journey. But the other side of the coin is they left behind them converts and churches. <laughs> there, was, there was opposition. And we said we, we should expect that. Don't expect things will go without opposition. But despite opposition, God blesses the word. Souls are saved. The stem, assemblies are established. And a great work is done. Well, now they're getting ready to return to the church which had commended them. And so this little section is their kind of return journey. But it's very instructive what it has to teach us in just a few verses. And so it says when they had preached the gospel to that city, that's a reference to, uh, to Derby in verse 20. Uh, it doesn't tell us in this passage, but there's a certain young man called Timothy who was from Derby who was converted at that time. Don't tell us that, but we'll learn a lot about Timothy later on. So again, what a blessing uh, that as they preach the gospel to that city, uh, somebody that we will come to know and love and appreciate in the scriptures was converted at that time. And then it says, and this is where we kind of break in for our study this morning. It, it says, after they taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. So they're, they're making their return journey. Now, I want to just say that that's not the quickest way to get back to where they were commended. In, in fact, 
um, it's not only not the quickest way, there would have been a lot shorter route if they were in a rush to get back home. But remember, they're going back the actual way they came and they're going back to the very cities where all these incidents had happened. What it tells us is these men were not cowards. <laughs> I mean, imagine a city where you'd been stoned. You might think twice about going back to that city. Uh, what about places where there had been plots to expel you or even attempts to stone you that failed? Uh, you might think, oh, I don't think I want to go through there. But they go back there, and there's a reason why they go back there, and that is this, their concern for the new converts. They want to go and revisit these places where they'd established a testimony. And so these Galatian cities, these are the churches of Galatia. When we read the book of Galatians, these are the churches of Galatia that have been established. And so they're returning by exactly the same road and they're doing it even though they have been stoned and, and all kinds of things. And of course, uh, you might ask the question, how could they get back in? Well, uh, Luke is silent. He doesn't tell us. Maybe part of it could be that this time their purpose is different. When they first came through these cities, the purpose was evangelism, and they were, they were publicly proclaiming the gospel, and there was hostility. This time they're going back, and their purpose is different. It is to, as we're going to see, strengthen the disciples. It's to, it's to establish these new churches and to deal with the new converts. So maybe there's a less pu public aspect, and so that's why they're able to go back into these cities. And so uh, the, obviously what, what it tells us is this, and this is the, a very important lesson. The follow-up of new converts is so vital that personal safety has to take a back seat, right? But these are dangerous places, but they recognize the importance of following up with new converts. And we've got to recognize that winning souls without proper follow-up is, is a hazardous thing. It's like giving birth and then just abandoning the baby, right? That's not a good thing to do. It happens sadly sometimes, but it's not a good thing to do. In fact, when you've had the baby, that's when the work really begins. And so they're taking seriously uh, these new converts, they need help and, and they need encouragement. And the practical lesson for us is this, Sometimes we need to place the needs of the people of God above our own comfort and convenience. Now, that's not just in new. I mean, this is the, this is this is the work of a shepherd, right? That there's the sense in which sometimes you just got to put your own convenience, your comfort to one side because God's people's needs are great. And that's what we see here. So what are they doing? What's their plan? Well, look at verse 22. It says, confirming the souls of the disciples and exalting them to continue in faith, in the faith, and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. So I want to kind of think about what they did with these disciples as they went through. First of all, this idea of the word confirming uh, the souls of the disciples. Uh, this, this word confirming if you look it up in Strong's, it tells you this. It means to support them further, to strengthen them. And again, they're, they're young baby Christians. They, they need strengthening. They need, uh, they need encouraging. They need establishing. They need help. They need further support. And so that is their mission. And you're going to see that this is a, a pattern you'll see throughout the Acts of the Apostles, that whenever they planted churches, they would, they would seek to go back there to strengthen the churches. Look at Acts 18. Just want to see this, this little pattern here. It says, Acts 18, verse 23. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went all over the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order strengthening all the disciples, going back to the same area, strengthening them further. Uh, Acts 15, back to chapter 15, verse 41. And he went to Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. 
And so the idea is to strengthen them. Now, notice it says uh, confirming the souls of the disciples. It uses this term disciples. And I want to kind of uh, hone in on that. In fact, it was interesting that the last hymn that Justin gave out probably didn't realize it, but it was very appropriate uh, because it was this idea of teach me thy way, O Lord. And, and it goes on and talks, I think in the last verse, it's uh, until life's past, teach me thy way. And, and so in other words, it's the whole, we're always learning. And the word disciple uh, simply has the idea of a learner. It's, it's that mentality of a learner. And so they want to confirm the souls of the disciples. And to be a true disciple of the Lord, we must have the mentality of a learner, a teachable spirit, which means we don't know it all. And it doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian, you cannot afford to lose the mentality of a learner. The minute you think you know it all, I, I really believe that you're, you're putting yourself on the shelf. We're always learning. In fact, last Lord's Day, uh, at the breaking of bread in Valley City, North Dakota, a guy got up and shared from Psalm 108. Just turned there just to show uh, it, was, it was a completely new thought to me and, and a blessed thought. Psalm 108, verse 1. He says, oh, God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise even with my glory. Oh, God, my heart is fixed. I'll sing and give praise even with my glory. I've read that hundreds of times. I've always had the idea in my mind. My heart is fixed. In other words, it's set. It is determined. It's kind of the idea. I'm fixed on doing this. I'm, I'm purposed to do it. And, and uh, that's not a wrong way to look at it. But <clears throat> what he shared was, oh, God, my heart is fixed. It was once really broken. And you fixed it. And because you fixed it, I will sing and give praise even with my glory. And I just thought, praise the Lord. Isn't it wonderful? You see, the scripture says, Psalm 147 says, the Lord is the one who heals the broken hearts. The broken heart. Isn't that wonderful? And, and every one of us, our heart was totally rotten, wasn't it? I mean, the heart is deceitful, desperately wicked above all things who can know it. And yet what the Lord does is fixes the heart. Now, he proved it from Strong's. He looked it up in Strong's and said, this is an appropriate way of looking at this verse. It's not saying that my way, look, but what it told me is this, you can never say, I know it all. Something could be shared and it just opens up a whole new vista of truth to you. And it doesn't matter whether you've been saved 20 years or two years. It doesn't make any difference. In fact, uh, I, I find it very disturbing when I hear people say, well, I've heard it all before. <laughs> I, I find that a very frightening attitude. Uh, it's an attitude full of pride, and it's foreign to the idea of discipleship. And, and I think when we make those kind of statements, I know it all. I think that that person is beyond help until the Lord humbles them and shows them they don't know it all. And God is very good at showing us we don't know it all. <laughs> uh, he knows how to adjust us. He knows exactly what to do to bring us to that place where, hey, I don't have all the answers. I don't know it all. So how does Paul propose to strengthen these disciples? Well, what he wants to do is encourage them. He says, exhorting them. Uh, that's a strong urge, a strong encouragement to continue in the faith. And we want to say this, that part of discipleship, a very important part of discipleship is continuance. Right. Back in Acts 2, we, we often talk about these verses. Those that gladly received his word were baptized and they continued steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine, Fellowship, Breaking of Bread and Prayers. That idea of continuance is really critical for discipleship. If, if we don't continue, uh, in other words, if we're not faithfully doing the things that we know to do, these means of grace, then we're not going to grow. We're just not going to grow. We have to, continuance is important. In fact, just look at John 8 for a minute, please. John chapter 8, uh, where the Lord tells us what a real disciple looks like. And he says in John 8, 31, and 32, read these words. It says, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. 
and again, you see this, if you continue in my word. Oh, how we need to encourage people to continue. Uh, today is a day of quitting. It's a, it's, that's the kind of mentality of the age. Things get tough, I'm out of here. I mean, people are always quitting. And people who are quitters never make good disciples. We've got to continue steadfastly, not varying, not wavering. Stick at it. Just keep going. Uh, this, is the, this is what he's encouraging them to do because there are difficulties. He's going to tell them in a minute that they're going to, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. There's a lot of trials and difficulties, but he says, continue. You keep going. Or oh, how to, to encourage people to continue. It's so important. We exhorted them to continue and then to continue in the faith. Of course, a phrase used often by Luke to refer to the body of doctrine, the truth believe that which we know as christian doctrine to continue in the faith uh, just look at again a few times luke mentions it in acts acts 6 verse 7 acts 6 verse 7 it says in acts chapter 6 verse 7 and the word of god increased and the number of the disciples multitude multiplied in jerusalem greatly and a great company of the priests were, were obedient to the faith. Uh, they believed that body of doctrine concerning the Lord Jesus and, and who he was. And, and what a wonderful thing for those priests uh, to do that. Chapter 13, again, please. And verse 8, chapter 13, verse 8. Just this idea again. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith, from this, this truth about the belief in the Lord Jesus. And then one more reference, please. Chapter 16 and verse 5. Acts 16, verse 5, where we once again see this idea of the faith. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. And so somebody has this learner's mentality and they continue in the faith this body of doctrine what it does is it makes them solid and stable uh, ephesians 4 talks about people who are established and they're not blown around by every wind of doctrine and and so we we need this today these are days where there's a lot of instability uh, it's the YouTube age. And I know I have a YouTube channel. I've got to be careful what I say, but why there's an awful lot of error on YouTube and people are listening to it and they're, they're buying into nonsense. Uh, just uh, doing a study with a young, young, few young men. And um, uh, they, they, they've been pressured to listen to a series on the book of revelation. Uh, and and I, I checked on this series. The guy is in left field. He believes everything happened in AD 70. There's nothing left to happen. It all happened back. I mean, it's utter rubbish. I mean, when did 144,000 Jewish evangelists get sealed before AD 70 and went everywhere preaching so a great multitude would say that nobody could number? Come on, give me a break. That didn't happen. None of these things happened. And so, but again, it's out there and these are eloquent people on the internet. And so we just got to say, we, we need to have a, a learner's mentality, but we need to learn in the safety of the local assembly and be careful about some of the things that are out there and be faithfully instructed. And again, it's a responsibility to instruct the saints so that they, they know what they believe and why. And so he says, confirming the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith. And then he tells them this, and we must. Now that must is something that is a certainty. We must, through much tribulation, enter in to the kingdom of God. And of course, what he's telling them is expect trouble. I mean, that's what they'd seen with, with Paul and Barnabas. Everywhere they'd been, there'd been trouble. Expect this. This is a hostile world. In fact, the Lord Jesus said, John 16, 33, these things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. First uh, John 3, verse 13, the Lord, uh, it says here, marvel not my brethren, if the world hate you. You see, we have believed in a savior who was despised and rejected of man. And now we're identified with him. 
And guess what? It hasn't changed much. Uh, my friend uh, up there in Edmonton, uh, just this week, two of the preachers up there have had their equipment damaged by hostile anarchists, basically. Uh, one of them had their, their boombox trod on and broken. And then my friend Dale, his boombox, they cut the wires to it. Hostility. But people are getting saved in the midst of it all. Despite all the opposition, people are actually calling on the name of the Lord and being saved on the streets of Edmonton. And yet there's opposition. And we, we must expect that. You must expect it. We should not be surprised when the world hates us. And I suspect that as our culture descends into paganism as we witness Romans chapter one before our very eyes and God giving them over to reprobate minds. That's what we're seeing in our culture. The hostility to the gospel will increase. But in the midst of that, still God is going to save souls and people are going to be blessed. And of course, he says that through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Doesn't that always been the pattern? Again, I, I think of uh, the story of David uh, when he was anointed king. And, and what happened? Did everybody welcome him? No, what happened? He was, he was jealous Saul, hunted him for several years, right? And, and, and then there were those people that saw that David was the rightful king and those that were in debt and those that were distressed and, 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 and those that were depressed, they gathered to David, didn't they? And they suffered with him in the time of his rejection. And when he was finally acknowledged as king, they shared with him in the glory of his kingdom. And so Christ, in the same way, he's anointed king at his baptism, is the rightful Messiah of Israel, yet he is rejected. And during this church age, Satan and his rebellious court refuse to give place to the Lord Jesus Christ. And those that are in distress and those that are in debt and those that are depressed, they've come to the Lord Jesus and recognized him as their David. And here we are. Our loyalty is continually being tested. But if we suffer with him, he says this, we shall also reign with him. And we've got to keep reminding ourselves, this is a day of rejection. Uh, the Corinthians got it all messed up. They were reigning as kings before the time. We've been reigning as kings in many ways because we've been living in a really weird time in church history where we haven't experienced much persecution. But reality check is coming, folks. This is what's going on in our world. And, and so he says in verse 23, and when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting. Now, this is interesting because these churches are less than a year old. And yet, they ordained or, we should say, appointed them elders in every church and prayed with fasting. What does that tell us? Churches can have their being without elders. In other words, there were already churches, but they weren't elders yet. But for their well-being they definitely need to have recognized elders. And so <clears throat> why are they so important? Well, they're needed for divine order and also to care for the flock. And so that's of course assuming elders take their responsibilities serious. What do we mean by elders, the ordained elders? Well, the word elder has the idea of a mature man. That's the idea. It's maturity that's in view. A gray headed man literally is the idea. And so these elders, and here's the interesting thing. It usually infers spiritual maturity, but these churches are less than a year old. Sometimes good just to think about things like the book of Acts, you know, because uh, like, can you imagine somebody who's only been saved a year and we recognize them as an elder? Now, that wouldn't happen here, but in that climate, it does happen. Now, why does it happen in a climate like that? And of course, no, no doubt they were praying and fasting because they're leaving these saints in the hands of these men who they recognize. And so we might say this, that um, it's evident that even amongst new converts, there are some that mature faster than others. And so I'll give you another example. I want you to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23, 
And again, remember, Paul had to leave Thessalonica very quickly, uh, only there a, a short time, uh, but because of opposition, they had to leave. And he instructs them by letter, and he tells them in chapter 5, verse 12, he says, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you, and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. And what that tells us is that even though it was only a short time, already the Holy Spirit had burdened men to care for the flock. To, to watch over them, to, to, uh, to exhort them. And, and so in a very short time, God is able to do that and often does that in missionary situations. And so what we could say is that the, in the book of Acts, um, elders were not appointed when a church was first founded. Rather, it was when the apostles revisited the churches that this was done. And, in, and the reason is there was intervening time where an opportunity for those who the Holy Ghost had burdened for the work were already showing they, they had that care for the flock. So we could say this leadership is plural, leadership is male, leadership is recognized. And in these early days before the scriptures were completely finished, um, it was left to the apostles and the apostle delegates to recognize the elders. Well, we don't have any apostles and apostle delegates anymore, but thankfully we do have 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1, and so we know what an elder looks like now, okay? We've got the scriptures. We have the word of God to help us in this process of recognizing oversight, but the important thing is this, that they saw how important these churches would, would have godly shepherds who would care for them. And it says that they prayed with fasting. Now, again, just one, one other comment about elders before we go any further, and that is this, that the, the, the qualifications in Timothy and Titus are all spiritual. In other words, it's not because a guy is a success in the world. They, they tried that in the Old Testament, right? We want a king like all the other nations. God said, okay, if that's what you want, I'll give you one. And he gave them Saul. How did he work out? <laughs> he was a disaster, right? Because he's, he's a worldly man. He looks the part. He's tall and handsome, right? And, and, and he's, he's like the nation's kings. And then when they, even later on, when David was appointed, uh, it was amazing how even Samuel was carried away. This guy looks handsome. He'd be a good one. And I'll say, no, no, it's not him. And, and he went through the whole list until finally, guess what? There's, there's, there's one who's not there. He's out looking after the sheep. He's a young lad that's kind of uh, fresh looking because he's out in the fields all the time. This is the man. He's showing that he cares by, the, by his shepherding work in the fields. He's the man. And so, again, we just want to say this, that we cannot allow worldly standards to determine who is an overseer. It's purely spiritual qualifications that are required. Now, let's just kind of do a quick summary. From verse 21 through 23, we have the apostolic pattern for missionary work. Preaching the gospel, teaching the converts, and establishing and strengthening churches. This is New Testament missionary work now the reason i say that is there's a lot of work goes on today on the mission field that doesn't look anything like this in fact there's a lot of work goes on has nothing to do with establishing churches or even preaching the gospel a lot of it is just social work and it staggers me i mean i just find it increasingly difficult in terms of giving to, to align our giving with the word of God in terms of missionary support. It's getting more difficult because there's so much stuff going on in the name of Christianity that bears no relationship to this. And what we need is a return to biblical patterns of missionary work. And this is what we find here. Preaching the gospel, seeing converts through the preaching of the gospel, 
gathering them together in churches, strengthening the churches, establishing the churches, teaching the converts, and then, of course, moving on to fresh fields. Look at verse 24. After they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pam Pamphylia. And so what's interesting is now, very brief, the brevity of the narrative emphasizes the increased pace now of the journey home. Across Pisidia from north to south, entered the neighboring province of Pamphylia. It tells us there's just one little delay. It, it, it says, uh, verse 25, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. Perga was an inland city close to the port city of Italia, um, 12 miles distance. Uh, they'd stopped there on the way. In fact, Perga was significant because that's where John Mark bailed out of the missionary team. And so it says they preached the gospel in Perga. Now, probably they had time there waiting for a ship. Maybe it'd be a while before a ship came uh, to disembark uh, for Syria. So uh, they landed there. They, they preached the gospel. And it's the only place where we, we, we read that mentioned. And perhaps part of the reason is because they had this time on their hand. Perhaps part of it was uh, it was a, a place where there's negative memories. There's this guy bailing out. And maybe they thought it would be good to have some positive memories here. And they preach the gospel there in Perga, and then they go back. Now, what do they do when they go back? Well, verse 26, thence they sailed to Antioch from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. In other words, they had completed their first missionary journey. They go back to the place that had commended them, the assembly uh, in Antioch. Uh, and uh, in Syria, and uh, it says, when they were come, they had gathered the church together and rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. Now, it's just a couple of interesting things that we, we find in these little verses here. First thing is this, perhaps this is the first missionary conference or missionary meeting in the history of the church, right? When they were come, they had gathered the church together and they rehearsed that all that God had done. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to many missionary meetings. Missionary meetings can be life-changing. Uh, I remember February, 1983, we went to a missionary meeting in Leeds, England, and it would change our whole lives. That was the night that God spoke to us about the Lord's work. And it was very clear. And there was a snowy night and they were telling people not to go out. And we went anyway. And, and the Lord spoke to us. I, I just said to Emery, it was so ironic that in February 2023, I was speaking in Quebec, Canada, uh, 40 years later, and uh, in, in snow almost above your head. And it was a snowy night in February 83. And, and the, the supreme irony was speaking to French speakers through a translator. And if anybody knows my story, uh, before I was saved, I was not a Francophile person. <laughs> I didn't love the French very much. And yet here I was preaching to French believers 40 years. God has such a sense of humor. I just think it's a, a remarkable how the Lord works. But missionary me meetings can be life-changing. But I, I want you to imagine what it must have been like to be at this missionary meeting. Well, tell us about your labors. You've been gone a year. What did you do? Well, it says we, uh, this is a quick summary. We preached to the Roman proconsul Sergius Paulus on the island of Cyprus. I mean, that's a pretty big deal, isn't it? I mean, he's, he's uh, you know, if, if you if you want to go to an embassy, the, 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 what they call a consular embassy, right? And it was, this is Rome's representative on the island of Cyprus. And the idea of a proconsul means that he's been in that position so long, they're kind of making it a permanent deal. This guy is a big wig on the island of Cyprus and they preached the gospel to him. Oh, by the way, there was, there was also this, this guy called Bar Jesus or Elymas, uh, who was a, a sorcerer and he tried to stop us preaching the gospel to this fellow, uh, Sergius Paulus, and oh, oh, by the way, we just judicially blinded him because he was opposed to the gospel. Oh, and then Sergius Paulus got saved. And then we, we had one of the party, John Mark, he deserted the missionary team. That was pretty discouraging. And then the whole city of Pisidian Antioch came out to hear the gospel and many were saved. 
And then Jewish opposition caused by jealousy caused the missionaries to have to leave. And then in Iconium, the gospel was preached and, and many were saved. And then the opposition uh, planned to stone them. The missionaries left for Lystra and Derby. In Lystra, Paul was stoned and left for dead. I mean, that would be kind of a gr dramatic story at a missionary prayer meeting. And probably had the scars to show them that he was stoned and left for dead. And then he said, oh, and by the way, uh, we went on to Derby and Timothy was converted. You'll get to know him soon. And then uh, they backtracked and strengthened the church is they appointed elders and they left behind lampstands in all these dark regions of Galatia. That's not a bad missionary prayer meeting, is it? I mean, <laughs> wouldn't you love to hear a missionary report like that? You say, wow, that is amazing. And that was in a year. And so as they tell this story, notice how they put it. When they were come and gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them i like that it's not we're telling you what we did no no we want you to know what god did through us <laughs> see it's god that does the work isn't it good to recognize that it's god that does the work? It's not us it's god he just uses vessels that are available to him look at what god did on this missionary journey it's like we were on for the along for the ride but look at what god did how god worked in marvelous ways and, and so he wants them to know this, that, that God did a great work. Now, we've, we've been looking just as we've gone through 13 and 14, one year in duration, A.D. 47 into A.D. 48. What can we learn by way of conclusion of this first missionary journey? Things that we can take home with us. Firstly, we need to recognize discipleship is important more important than our personal comfort because people take time right to invest in somebody's life is time consuming and we're all busy and so discipleship is important especially in new converts but no matter how old we are we're never too earl old to learn new things from the lord and from his word and we need to be aware that we don't get to that place of pompous piety where we think we know it all. God deliver us from that kind of arrogance. No, we're still learning. And even when we finish learning, as we were mentioning this morning, when we get to glory, we're going to say the half has not been told us. Amen. We're still waiting in the shallows. There's so much more yet to learn. And we want to keep that teachable learning mentality. Our loyalty to Christ is being tested constantly in this world. It's still under the influence of the wicked one. It's still hostile to the Lord Jesus. And even this week, maybe our loyalty to the Lord Jesus may be put to the test. Are we recognizing that we may have to suffer rejection and reproach for his name's sake? Do we embrace that and believe that to be true? Is our view of biblical leadership influenced by worldly success or by biblical truth and then the last thing notice he says again in verse 27 how he had opened the end of verse 27 how he had opened the door of faith onto the gentiles now we tend to think that you know the keys of the kingdom were given to peter and he was the first to preach the gospel, you know, to the Jews and the Samaritans and, and then, you know, well, I mean, to bring them in uh, by laying hands on them. And then he went to Cornelius. And there's a truth to that. But this is different. This opening the door of faith to the Gentiles is not a Gentile on Jewish soil. See, Caesarea Philippi was on Jewish soil. This is now going into the very heartland of a pagan world and god has opened the door of faith to the gentiles how we need to pray for god to open doors where we are lord would you open doors we've got a message <laughs> we're not very good at sharing that message we're not you know we're not bold evangelists but lord would you open doors for us and lord give us the courage to go through the door if you open the door <laughs> Now, there's a, there's a great servant of the Lord. Um, uh, uh, he's, um, 
I won't mention his name, but uh, he, he's, he's seen assemblies established all over North America. But one of the things about him is if he gets an open door, he goes through it. Uh, he led somebody to Christ and this person said, oh, I have relatives and they live way up in the Northwest Territories, you know, which is kind of up where the Inuits live, you know, kind of very difficult to even get there. But he said, would, would you, if I called my relatives, would you go and share with them? No problem, I'll go. So he goes up there, very difficult to get there. I mean, even to get a flight or to, how do you get to the Northwest Territories from anywhere? I mean, they're, they're pretty isolated, but he goes. And he goes to see this one guy's relative and the relative said, okay. He said, hold on a second. I want to get the whole village. They need to hear this. He brought the whole village out and this guy had a chance to preach the gospel and an assembly was established in this remote Northwest Territory Inuit place because a guy saw an open door and he went through it. Wow, isn't that amazing? What could God do if we saw open doors and sometimes we're so dull, we don't even see it <laughs> and then had the courage to go through it. And so <clears throat> he tells us, and there, verse 28, they abode long time with the disciples. Again, there's a lot of new things happening here. We've had the first missionary prayer meeting. Now, maybe we're having the first missionary furlough. <laughs> they spent a long time with the disciples. They went back to Antioch where they were commended. They spent time. I'm sure they weren't, uh, you know, kind of sunning themselves on a beach or anything like that. I'm sure that they were serving the Lord there, but they spent time with the assembly that had commended them for them to, uh, you know, things have changed in a year, get to know what's happened and just to spend time with them and encourage them and refresh them in the work of the Lord, because it's not going to be long before they're going to be going out on the second missionary journey, but they're having a time of refreshment in between. So that takes us to the end of chapter 14. Now, of course, the opening door of faith to the Gentiles is going to raise a few problems, but we'll have to wait till we get to chapter 15 before mm -hmm. we find out what those problems are. Of course, one of the big problems is, well, do these Gentiles have to become Jews in order to be the real deal? <laughs> That's the big question. Aren't you glad that we don't have to become Jews in order to become the real deal? <laughs> Praise God for the gospel to the Gentiles. Let's pray. Our Father, we, we're thankful for the power of the gospel that could save communities in, in Galatia and that they could be so well saved that within a year there could be elders recognized in these churches lord we're thankful for the faithful labors of these missionaries lord we do pray for for more vision uh, ourselves lord would you give us open doors would you give us a bigger heart for missions lord we don't we don't hear many missionary reports anymore lord give us a, a, a more of a heart like the lord jesus who looked on the fields he saw they were white and ready to harvest. And he even asked that we would pray that the Lord of the harvest would thrust out laborers into that harvest. Lord, give us that kind of vision like the Savior. And Lord, help us to strengthen disciples, to encourage them to continue in the faith, to not be quitters, to stick at it. Uh, we pray, Father, you'd help us to learn that our personal comfort and convenience is not the most important thing. But the needs of others is more important. Lord, give us that kind of mind. We'll give thee the glory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.